Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Amen. 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 I'm trying to get as much amens out of you now because someone, something tells me there won't be a whole lot of amening during the sermon. <laughs> if you have your copy of God's word with you, amen. <laughs> I invite you to turn in there with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, to Acts chapter four, beginning in verse 32. We will be reading up to Acts chapter five, verse 11. Luke gives us two portraits of giving, two portraits of giving. One portrait is one that we should follow. The other portrait is one that we should ignore. Luke chapter four, Acts chapter four rather, verse 32. I'm reading out of the NIV. Please follow in whatever version that you may have. My Bible reads this way. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from their sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and, and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money and put it for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and had kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. With, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in. Not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said. That is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At, the mo at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his word. Will you pray with me? God, teach us great and powerful truths contained in your word. Let our attitudes be different as we encounter you in your word, Lord God, and our prayer as always is this. As your word is explained, you would be exalted. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all who are God's people said. For those of us who are regular readers of God's word, whether you want to admit it or not, even you have to confess that there are times when you're reading through the Bible, you will encounter a passage that makes you feel uncomfortable. The passage presents a portrait of God who is either overly judgmental or harsh. In Genesis chapter 7, 
when we read that God destroys all of the inhabitants of the earth. No doubt a group that contained young women and children, we are left feeling uncomfortable that God can do such a thing. When in the book of Joshua, we read that God orders and ordains the genocide of an entire people group just so the Israelites can take possession of the land. When we read it, we are left feeling uncomfortable that God can do such a thing. There are times in, in scripture where God seems to throw a tantrum, tantrum and, seems, and seemingly lashes out at people for the slightest offense. In, in 2 Kings chapter 2, a group of over 40 young boys encounter the prophet Elijah, and, and apparently the prophet Elijah has a receding hairline. So they refer to Elijah as baldy. Elijah curses the young boys, and God orders two bears to come out of the forest, and the two bears massacre these 42 young men, it leaves us feeling uncomfortable. And then there are the bizarre times when, when God orders a death sentence for seemingly innocuous events. Did you know that in, in ancient Israel, the penalty for talking back to your parent was that you would be taken outside and stoned to death? How many of us would still be alive if that was the case today? We are left feeling uncomfortable. There are passages that leave us feeling uncomfortable when they refer to the practice of treating women like they were mere chattel. David had over 700 wives and concubines and God allowed it and Solomon had over 1,000 wives and concubines and God allowed that. Does that not make you feel uncomfortable? And then there are times in, in scripture where God condones the actions that he should condemn. Slavery was not outlawed in ancient Israel. And in fact, God allowed the practice. We read in Exodus 21, verse 20 and 21, that anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But if they are not, but they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. God, in his word, in his instructions to ancient Israel said, if you kill your slave by beating him too much, you need to be punished. But, but if you beat him and he recovers in time, tell that slave to get back to work. We are left feeling uncomfortable. Acts chapter 5 is, is another passage that when we read, we all feel uncomfortable. God seemingly punishes people harshly and severely, a punishment that is unwarranted considering the crime. After all, did Ananias and Sapphira really have to die for what they did? They still gave God something. But Acts chapter 5 should not make us feel uncomfortable because of what God did. The real reason why you and I should feel uncomfortable when reading Acts chapter 5 is if you and I share in the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5 is is part of a larger body of work, a part of a larger narrative piece that begins back in Acts chapter four. In the last part of Acts chapter four, continuing on through Acts ch chapter five, verses 11, Luke gives us a glimpse into the life and practices of the early church. This is one of the only looks 
into the behavior of the early church that we have in the New Testament. For Luke, his purpose in, in painting this portrait for us of the early church is both descriptive and prescriptive. Luke is not just telling us what the early church did, but Luke is also exhorting us that in our communities, we need to practice and behave like the early church practiced and behaved. And if there is one defining characteristic of the early church, if there's one thing that you can say about the early church is that they were unified in everything. In Acts chapter four, verse 32, Luke writes that all believers were one in heart and mind, that they were unified in purpose and in agenda. This opening statement of Acts chapter four, verse 32, looks backwards and it looks forward. It, look back, it looks backwards, back to Acts chapter four, Acts, Acts chapter three, and the opening section of Acts chapter four, where John and Peter went into the temple and there they healed a lame man. And because they healed a lame man, they were beaten, jailed, beaten again, and then released from prison. And as they were released, they were told by the powers that be that they should never preach the gospel of Jesus Christ again. When, when John and Peter got back with the early church, the early church not only celebrated what had happened, in response to the potential that every time they preached Jesus, the early church committed that persecution would not stop their proclamation. The early church was committed in their mission. Now, in Acts chapter four, verse 32, Luke invites us to look forward. He invites us to, to look forward as he gives us another example of how the early church was unified. This time, they were united in their willingness to share their resources with one another. Luke says that in the early church, no one claimed their possessions as their own. What Luke is saying by this is that one of the practices of the early church is that none of the Christians in that community asserted owner's rights over anything that they had. Rather, if one person owned something, the entire community owned that thing. And if one person had access to something, the entire community had access to that thing. I told y'all I wasn't gonna get any amens today. If this practice happened today, if we all had access and, and co-owned our possessions, you, you know what they would call the Christian church? A cult. One of the defining characteristics of a cult, according to psychologists, is that the cults, the inheritance, have to give over ownership of their possessions to the group. But in cults, this handing over of possessions is something that people are compelled to do. In the early church, in the church that Luke is describing, they weren't compelled to give over their possessions. Rather, they gave over their possessions because they were concerned for one another. The reason why people in the early church wanted to hand over possessions of what they had, wanted to share ownership of everything they had is because they loved one another that much. They were compelled to do so out of the love that they had for the individual members of the church. What verse 32 describes, verse 34 and 35 explains this, this sharing of possessions did not mean that everyone in the Christian community had the keys to your house. It didn't mean that the pastor could stop by your place and, and pick up your car anytime he wanted. It did not mean that, 
the group had simultaneous ownership of your possessions. What it meant was that if there was a need present in the church, the people of that community were willing to sell what they had so that they can meet that need. And though Luke highlights certain people, he says that those who had extra land and extra property would sell that to meet the need. The responsibility of fulfilling the needs in the early Christian community did not fall exclusively on the wealthy, but rather everyone who could contribute something would contribute something. This is what's so unique about the early church is that both rich and poor, wealthy and impoverished shared the commitment to fulfill the needs of the church. Many of us are, are familiar with the old folk tale, Stone Soup. It, it's about a group of hungry travelers who walk into a town and, and ask for food, and the people in that town are, are so selfish that, that they refuse to give any of their resources. But, but not only are the people of that town selfish with the strangers, the people of that town are, are selfish with each other. All of them have, have something. But because they're unwilling to share it with the community, they only have that which they have. So these strangers come up with a unique method to, to encourage the people to share it. They, they find the biggest pot that they can find. Go down to a stream, fill the pot with, with water, and then throw some rocks into that pot, and, and they begin to boil to cook something. When, when someone walked by, they would tell that person, we are making stone soup, the most delicious soup in the world. But you know what would make this soup even better? If we had some carrots. And that person would respond by saying, you know, I, 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 I've got some carrots. I can give you some carrots to, to, to eat some of this stone soup. And they would contribute their carrots. Someone else would come by. And the, and the story would play itself out again. We're making stone soup, but we need some potatoes. Someone else would walk by. We're, we're making stone soup, but we need chicken. And, and the community was encouraged to share their resources and when it was all said and done, these strangers took the stones out of the pot. And because everyone in the community was willing to share what they had, everyone that day enjoyed the most delicious soup that they ever had. And really, this is, this is what Luke is saying, how the Christian community in the early church operated. Everyone had something, and everyone put it into the pot. Only, they didn't have to be tricked into contributing to meet the needs of others. They did so out of their love for one another. Luke chapter 4. Luke tells us, gives us a, another picture of the early church, that they were united in their willingness to share their possessions. Beginning in, in verse 36. Luke will hold up one individual for us, and he will shine the spotlight on that individual. And, and that spotlight, that, that light that Luke is shining on that individual makes him an example of godly giving. If there was one person who exemplified the care concerning and giving nature of the early church, it would be the individual of verse 36. His name was Joseph. But the apostles decided to start calling him Barnabas. Luke tells us that Barnabas means translated son of encouragement, or better yet, son of exhortation. Barnabas was a preacher and missionary whose exploits would become well known throughout the early church. Barnabas was one of the first church leaders who believed in the conversion story of the apostle Paul. It was Barnabas who would facilitate to include Paul in church life. It was in Barnabas who invited Paul to join the work of the church in Antioch. It was Barnabas who mentored Paul during his first missionary journey. And it was Barnabas 
who exited stage left so that Paul can play the prominent role in the book of Acts. Without Barnabas, we don't get Romans 8.28, and we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Without Barnabas, we don't get Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, because without Barnabas, the foundation is never laid for Paul's ministry. But before Barnabas gained a reputation as being this great preacher, a church planter, and a mentor, he was known to the church as a giver. Barnabas, at the end of chapter four, is for Luke a picture of godly giving because Barnabas gave what he had and Barnabas gave to fulfill a need. And note, in this short little detailed sketch of Barnabas' giving, Luke never mentions how much Barnabas gave. We don't know whether the parcel of land that, that Luke, that Barnabas sold and contributed to the apostles was, was worth a million dollars or whether it was worth $10 because the amount that Barnabas gave did not matter. It was the attitude that Barnabas gave with that was important to Luke. You missed your amen moment right there, Central. The amount that Barnabas gave is not what Luke cares about. It's the attitude that Barnabas had while giving that Luke wants to hold up for us. And for the second time in the passage, in verse 37, we read that Barnabas took what he had and put it at the apostles' feet. Back in verse 35, we hear of other Christians doing the, the same thing, taking what they have and laying it at the apostles' feet. The fact that the early church was, was willing to give what they had in submission to the apostles, give their resources so that the apostles could use however they chose to use it, says something about the character of the church leaders, and it also says something about the nature of their giving. In the early church, the fact that they could lay resources at the apostles' feet says to us that people in the early church weren't concerned whether or not the next day they would see Peter come to church in a hooped up camel sitting on 26 inch hooves. They weren't concerned that John would, would buy a new mansion right next to Herod. They, they weren't concerned that they were funding James's 30, $65 million new aircraft jet because the men who served the early church served them with integrity. They didn't see other people's resources as a reason and excuse for them to become rich. They weren't in the business of exploiting people's givings. Rather, when they gave to the apostles, the apostles not only were concerned about providing for themselves, the apostles were concerned about providing for other people. They didn't prioritize their needs over and above the needs of other people. I'm trying to help somebody today. The apostles were men of integrity because they didn't see people's givings as an excuse for them to become rich. Yes, the early church had a responsibility to take care of the apostles. Paul in, in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18 writes that the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor. honor especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain and the worker deserves its wages. Church had a responsibility to care for the apostles. But in that responsibility, the apostle didn't take all the resources and keep it for themselves. The apostles were not out to get rich, rather they took what they need and serve the other community. And, and because the apostles were, 
were men of integrity who could be trusted with the resources allocated to them. Barnabas and others did not have to worry about what was done with those resources. Barnabas and others can give it to the apostles and not worry about how that money was spent. Something in the example of Barnabas, that when you give, you no longer own the gift that you're giving. You can't dictate to a church or to an individual how the money you give should be spent. If you can't trust that church, that individual, to spend it wisely, to be proper stewards of the resources you give, then Central, you shouldn't be giving to that church or to that individual. Late Dr. Gene Scott tells this story. Gene Scott lived in California and he had a, a huge radio ministry and frequently he would allow people to call into the radio and ask him questions about the Bible. Gene Scott had, was a brilliant Bible scholar who knew Hebrew and Greek. He could answer almost any Bible question that you posed to him. One day, someone concerned about what Dr. Scott was doing with their, their donations called into the radio show and asked Dr. Scott, I just want to know, what do you do with all that money that I send to your ministry? Dr. Scott became furious and yelled at the man, how dare you call me asking me what I do with the money you send me? Do I call your house and ask you what you do with the teaching I give you? And in a way, Dr. Scott was right. When we give, we relinquish responsibility of that gift. It is no longer ours. Therefore, when you give, you need to be proper stewards of your resources and trust that you give to a ministry, to an individual that will do the right thing with the resources you give. Can, can I take a minute just, just to brag on this church for a little bit? Just, just to let you know what, what is done with the resources that are given to this church. First of all, this is the only church that I know of in New York City, and others can testify of this, that don't charge for ministry work. If there is a marriage that needs to be performed here, it's free of charge. If there's a funeral that needs to be had here, it is absolutely free of charge. The, the pastors or the facilities don't charge a fee to conduct any ministry because of your giving. Your giving allows us to do that. There has never been an individual at Central in my five-year ministry, my five-year ministry, who has needed rent paid, groceries, or some type of financial help, who has been turned away empty-handed. Let me say that again. In five years here, there has never been one person who showed up at the door and said, Pastor, I'm getting put up out my house tomorrow if I don't come up with rent money. And, and that happens more <laughs> than, than, than just a little bit. Who have been, Pastor, if I don't get this money today, my, my lights, my water, something will be cut off there. There's never been a person in, in five years who showed up at this church with that scenario, what, what, whether they come to church four Sundays a month or they come to church two Sundays a month, there, there, there's never been a person who showed up and turned away empty-handed. And your giving allows us to do that. It, what I'm trying to say is that we try to deal in with integrity, with the resources that you give us. We try to use the resources that we are given to expand God's kingdom. And believe me this, no one gets rich working at Central. <laughs> you shouldn't be clapping over that. 
Barnabas becomes for us the example of godly giving because Barnabas gave with the proper attitude. Barnabas is, is the golden child of the early church family, but, but just like there's always a, a golden child in the family, there's always a, a black sheep in the family. In chapter five, verses one through 11, we are introduced to the black sheep of the early church family, Ananias and Sapphira. I'll, I'll quickly review the events of, of, of that passage. Ananias and, and Sapphira, like Barnabas, they sell a piece of property. And, and like Barnabas, with the money that they have gotten for that property, they lay it at the apostles' feet. But, but unlike Barnabas, they hold back some of the money that they receive. In fact, in verse 2, we are told that they kept back part of the money. That, that word, kept back, means to commit financial fraud. They kept back some of the money. And there are parallel scenes that describe what happened to first Ananias and then his wife, Sapphira. Ananias, Peter, through supernatural knowledge, knows that Ananias has not given everything that he said he would give. He asks Ananias, did you give what you said you were going to give? Ananias said, yes. And God judges Ananias almost immediately. And the same thing happens to, to Sapphira. And at the end of, of this story, if we're honest with ourselves, we, we, we kind of feel bad for Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira, after all, they did give something. No doubt there were other people in the early church who gave absolutely nothing. What, what is God doing punishing givers like that? First of all, it's not about the amount that Ananias and Sapphira gave. God never needs us to, to defend him. In fact, God is so sure that he's innocent. He's allowed Luke to pin this story, even and he inspired Luke to pin this story and include it in, in the book of Acts. If God were ashamed of his actions, I'm sure he would have told Luke, nah, nah, nah. Don't, don't put that in there. <laughs> I don't want people to know that about me. But rather, God, in including this story in the Holy Scriptures, is saying that he's proud of his actions, even though it makes us feel uncomfortable to know that God can be like this. Why is God proud of what he's done to, seemingly pe to people who seemingly don't deserve what has happened to them? shouldn't make us feel uncomfortable with what God has done. Because in judging Ananias and Sapphira, God is protecting the integrity of the community. God is protecting the integrity of the community. In verse four, we read that Peter says to Ananias that he has allowed Satan to come into his heart. Satan saw what was going on in the early church. And Satan, like always, wanted to ruin and destroy the work of God. And Satan found a, a willing vessel in Ananias and a willing vessel in Sapphira. And Satan, like a cockroach, when he gets into a community, will spread and spread and ruin everything. I've heard the story of a man who sold his house to another man. And after months of living outside of his home, he decided that he wanted to buy that home back. He went up to the man and said, I want to repurchase the home that you purchased from me, but the man refused. I will not sell it back to you. So the man who wanted to buy back the house made a deal with the other man. You don't have to sell me the entire house. I just want you to sell me one nail on the door, one nail on the door, and I'll give you however much money you want me to give you for one nail on the door. The other man thought about it, and he agreed. I will sell you just one nail on the door. 
The next morning after the transaction, the man who owned the house came into the house to find that the man who had owned, purchased the one nail, had hung the carcass of a dead dog on that one nail. And eventually, the smell of that carcass forced the other man to move out of the house. He wound up selling the house for less money than he would have previously. And, and, and that's how Satan works. Satan doesn't need a, a room in your house. <laughs> Satan doesn't need an, a, a foot in your house. All Satan needs is an inch in your house. And if you give Satan an inch, he will ultimately take possession of the entire house. And, and that's what God is trying to prevent in this passage. If the sin of Ananias and Sapphira are left to continue, it will create a stench in the house of God that is unbearable. So in order to eliminate the stench, God has to eliminate Ananias and Sapphira. We shouldn't be uncomfortable with God's actions. It tells us that, that God is working to protect the community of believers. And, and it tells us that, that, that God feels a certain way about sin. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us that if sin, if your right hand causes you to sin, what should you do with it? Cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, what should you do with it? That, that, that's how serious Jesus and God is about sin. That anything that causes you to sin should be eliminated, whether it's a body part or other people. If you have friends that lead you into a lifestyle of sin, if you have family members that lead you into a lifestyle of sin, God's word to you this morning is that you need to quickly eliminate them. Ananias and Sapphira were not only giving Satan a foothold in the house of God, but they were also bringing sin into the house of God. And God, in order to protect the house, in order to show the people how serious he was about sin, eliminated them. And twice in the narrative, we are told that fear gripped the entire church community and everyone who heard about it. It's godly fear. It's godly fear that produces godly righteousness. Because you and I would think twice about lying and stealing if people next to us was falling on the ground dead every time they lied and steal. God, his actions shouldn't make us feel uncomfortable. Rather, we should rejoice that God is working to protect his community. And we should rejoice that God is working to eliminate sin, which what, what should make us feel uncomfortable is the implicit warning in the text. The implicit warning in the text of what is God's attitude towards people who have the wrong attitude towards giving. In verses four and five, Peter says enough for us to know that we are not told the whole story. There are important details about the giving that Peter left, leaves out that, that we can assume. We, we can assume that the church had a need. We can assume that Ananias and Sapphira said that they would meet that need. We can assume that Ananias and Sapphira agreed with the apostles that whatever they received for selling the parcel of land, they would give its in entirety to the apostles. That's why Peter said that they were not just lying to the church, they were also lying to God. They broke an agreement. They broke an agreement. And the reason why Ananias and Sapphira broke their agreement was because there's a spirit in them that we, if we examine ourselves, can find in our own hearts. There is a spirit in Ananias and Sapphira that is often found in our own hearts, a, a spirit of wanting to receive the praise of men, 
over and above the praise of God. Ananias and, and Sapphira agreed to give everything that they had for the sale of the land to the apostles. And they did it in a public manner. All the while they knew they were keeping a portion of it back. And they did it publicly so that people can praise them for what they gave. They desired people to praise them for their giving rather than they desired to, for God to, to praise them for their obedience. God is not concerned about how much money we give. God was not concerned about how, 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 much, uh, how, how much Ananias and Sapphira gave that, that might have impressed other people in the church for Ananias and Sapphira to come before the apostles and lay before them a, a bucket of money. Other people might have been like, wow, look at how much Ananias and Sapphira are giving. But in the eyes of God, no amount of giving can replace obedience. R remember Jesus, remember Jesus' actions in the temple? R remember when he was observing the giving of others? Remember there were people there who were putting in huge sums of money and they were being praised for it. And, and this widow came in and put in a might. Remember who God praised as a result? Jesus said it was that widow who gave less than what everyone else had given, who gave more in the eyes of God. Man counts your offering one way. God counts your offering differently. Ananias and Sapphira were condemned because of their actions, because they had a spirit in them that is often in us when they were more concerned about receiving praise from people than they were about being, than they were about being obedient to God. And, and Ananias had a spirit, and Sapphira had a spirit in them that we often find in our own heart that they cared more about possessions than they cared about people. They cared more about possessions than they cared about people. It may have been, in fact, that, that Aaron, Ananias and Sapphira were about to, to give all the proceeds of the sale of the land of the property to the apostles. And then they thought to themselves, you know what? I, I can buy myself a, a new pair of shoes with some of this money. I, I can buy myself a, a new suit. I, I, I can take a little trip with some of this money. So, so, so Ananias, Sapphira, here, here, here's what we should do. We should keep some of the money for ourselves and then give whatever's left over to the people. And, and the only motivating reason for this is that they cared more about possessions than they do about people. You and I may, may say that we're not guilty of this, but how often do you and I hold back money from God and instead use it to buy a, another pair of shoes that we don't need? How often do, do you and I hold back money, keep from being generous in order to buy a, another item of clothing that we don't need? How often implicitly by our spending habits do we say to God that we care more about stuff than we care about people? And this is the attitude that God cannot stand. God really, really doesn't care about how much you give. God doesn't care if it's a dollar or a million dollars, but, but when you give, God wants to ensure that you give it with the right attitude that you give so that you can receive praise from him and not people. And that you give because you're more concerned about people than you are about possessions. Will you pray with me? Father, Lord God, help us our giving to reflect an attitude that would please you and please you only help, help that if the spirit of Ananias lives in us or, 
or, and Sapphira lives in us or in this church, Lord God, through patience, through grace, and through mercy, you would have eliminated rather than through judgment. Help us be the type of givers that, that honor you. Help us be the type of givers that look to, to help others. And help us be the type of givers that you can trust to give more to. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.